Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Leadership Now with me, Dan Pontefract. Today in the house, oh my gosh, have I been waiting for this one? From Limitless all the way up to what? Wonder hell. It's Laura Gasner Odding, LGO, who is author, catalyst, and executive coach who inspires people to push past the doubt and indecision that keep great ideas in limbo by helping audiences think bigger and accept greater challenges that reach beyond their current limited scope of belief. Laura, of course, as mentioned, is the author of Limitless, How to Ignore Everybody, Carve Your Own Path, and Live Your Best Life, which debuted at number two on the Washington Post bestseller list. And today, however, we're going to talk about Wonder Hell. More in a minute about that. Laura's rebellious and entrepreneurial edge has been well honed over a 25-year career that started when she dropped out of law school to join an unknown Southern governor's presidential campaign and ended up as a presidential appointee in who? Yep, Bill Clinton's White House, where she helped shape AmeriCorps. She left a leadership role as the youngest vice president at a nationally respected search firm when she realized that her boss's definition of success didn't quite align with hers and instead founded and ran one of the fastest growing search firms in the country, partnering with the full gamut of mission-driven executives from startup dreamers to scaling social entrepreneurs to global philanthropists. In 2015, LGO, Laura sold that firm to the team who helped her build it. Since that time, she's appeared on regularly Good Morning America, GMA, and the Today Show, and her writing's been seen in Harvard Business Review, Forbes, HR Magazine, as she now delivers strategic thinking, well-honed wisdom, and perspective generated by decades of navigating change across the startup, corporate, nonprofit, political, as well as that philanthropic landscape to organizations right across the world. Laura, dear friend... This book, how in the hell of wonder do you define wonder hell? Let's start there. Yeah, Dan. Oh, my God. It is so good to be talking with you. Uh, okay. You know those moments where you've accomplished something? Like, it could be something huge. It could be just something small, but it's something you didn't even know you could do. And you're like, that's amazing. That's exciting. It's wonderful. Okay. And also, as I do it, I'm seeing a version of myself that I didn't know was possible. The work I did opened more doors than I ever thought possible, but also through those doors, I now see even more doors that I never thought were possible for me. So in that moment, you see this potential of who you are and the burden of that potential comes and sits itself on your shoulders. And it's like, hey, Dan, what you got for me? Are you going to live into this newfound you that you didn't even know existed last year, last month, last year? Or are you gonna let it pass you by? So it's amazing, it's exciting, it's wonderful, but it's also anxiety provoking and stress inducing and there's exhaustion and burnout and uncertainty it's also kind of hell it's wonderful and it's hell that's wonder hell okay well okay so it sounds like one of the greatest oxymorons ever next to jumbo shrimp and <laughs> exactly uh, if the book itself is 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 beautifully done from the perspective of storytelling and you go through all these different parks and maps and ways in which to describe what wonder hell means and how to get out of it and knowing that you're going to be in it so you're quite factual about the fact that wonder hell happens yo get over it one of the lines i love there's a several i would like to get to in this book by the way when we talk today but one of them is our goal is to stand on the edge of our incompetence <laughs> yes. which is a, which is another juiciest oxymoron ever so tell us about that statement and how it relates back to wonder hell yeah. So when I found myself in Wonder House, so as you mentioned, Limitless debut, number two, Washington Post bestseller. And I was like, well, who's got number one? How do I get to number <laughs> one? And of course, it was Michelle Obama. And she was like nine and a half million books ahead of me. But I was like, if I made Washington Post, what about this USA Today and this Wall Street Journal and New York Times? I wonder who does that. I wonder if I could ever do that. Could I ever do that? And in that moment of thinking about it, I saw myself as a New York Times bestseller and I was like, oh, I want to do that. Like I couldn't unsee it. Right? I couldn't unsee it. And so I was, it, there was this moment where I was uh, actually on an airplane traveling back from Vancouver, right near where you are. And I had literally just opened a conference for Malala, like Malala, Malala, right? Like, well, that's insane. And the next morning, so Friday afternoon, the next morning was my goddaughter's bat mitzvah. Can't miss Malala. Not going to miss my goddaughter's bat mitzvah. So I'm on a red eye. And man, I'm too old for red eyes, right? But I'm on this red eye. And I'm in this like, center seat it's like sandwiched between these like two ex football players, I'm sure and they're snoring on my shoulders. And I could not fall asleep. And at four in the morning, I opened up my laptop and I was like, 
I don't know, man, it's 7 a.m., it's 4 a.m., it's 1 a.m. I have no idea, but I'm 1,200 miles from where I've been and 1,200 miles from where I'm going. And somewhere between the blur that was yesterday and the blur that will be tomorrow is the space I'm in right now. And that space is this moment of excitement, but uncertainty, of joy, but fear, of passion, but doubt, right? I was, I'm like, I'm not in the center seat. I, I'm actually in wonder hell. I'm in this space. And I, I I didn't really do much with it. I sort of put that up on Facebook. And then a bunch of people were like, that's a good word. You should do that for your next book. <laughs> and, and I didn't do anything with it. And then nine months later, the pandemic happened. And so I'm in the pandemic and I'm still thinking about this moment that I had. And I started going live to my community every day on social media. And after about two weeks of that, I got really bored of my own voice. So I started inviting friends to come along and join me. And we were having these conversations about these moments in our lives that changed everything. And what I realized was that there were these themes in there. People felt like imposters. They were full of doubt. They had burnout. All these questions, this tsunami of emotions that came at them at the very moment where they were supposed to be, things were supposed to be getting easier. And what I realized was that you never actually get through one under hell. You just learn how to look forward to it and enjoy it and plan for it and learn from it and maybe enjoy the ride. And the key part of Wonder Hell is that we need to be on the very edge of who we think we can become, right? The bleeding edge of our incompetence. We're told so often that that's the space that we should retreat from because it's uncomfortable. But the truth is that we're never really going to figure out everything we can be unless we push the boundaries a little bit. So why not spend a little time right out there? Like, I'm not saying like jump off the mountain, but I'm saying like nine toes over the edge of incompetence, you're going to learn some things about yourself. And I think you're going to be surprised at what you can actually do. So related, which is a wonderful way to describe, you know, that line, you, you interviewed a ton of people for the book. And you really, I think, make the point in the book that uh, those successful people understood that kind of uncomfortable feelings surrounding their success aren't just obligatory as yes. part of the process, but they're actually incredible, uh, helpful allies ultimately yes. in the process. So what did you learn from some of those people yourself, even uh, in relation to the question I just asked? And then this one about this, you know, notion that uncomfortable feelings, it's okay. Yeah, I really thought that when I went about having these conversations, and I talked to like a hundred glass ceiling shatterers, Olympic medalists, startup unicorns, everyday people like me and you, and I really thought I was going to find a way through it. I thought I was going to find a way to get rid of imposter syndrome, to quiet the doubt, uh -huh. to not worry about you know things feeling out of control and out of hand. I, I really thought I was going to find answers. Now, I'm 52 years old, and I probably shouldn't have been that naive, but I was 100% sure that these people who were like bold-faced names and bold-faced organizations knew some secrets I didn't know. And what I learned from them is that we all have these voices inside of our heads that are like, don't do it that's scary like oh my god you haven't done this before and you and i may hear those voices that way but these people hear the voices as oh my god you haven't done this before so they see them as excitement i mean you know you speak on stages just like i do and i remember very early on being told that the feeling of fear that feeling of my heart is racing it's palpitating my stomach has got butterflies my knees feel a little you know uncertain that feeling of fear is the same feeling of excitement in your body. Like it manifests the same way. It's just a story that we're telling ourselves about it. And so I was I was amazed about that. I mean, one of the people that I talked to uh, was Alex Ferreira, who is the, like he won the X Games. He won uh, um, uh, the Do Tour. He's, you know, an Olympic silver medalist in, uh, in, in, in freestyle skiing. And freestyle skiing are the people who like fly up into the air and do like, a billion turns and then come back down. And, and this is a sport that he's literally creating as it's going. So every time he does something, it's like Roger Bannister's four minute mile. Nobody thinks you can go like four times around until Alex does it. And then everyone's like, well, suddenly everybody does it. Now Alex has to figure out how to go five times around. So the sport is probably one of the most dangerous sports that's out there. And I was like, what do you do? Like, what do you do when you're in the starting blocks and you're like ready to go? What do you think about? What do you tell yourself? And he's like, nothing. I was like, nothing. Like, come on. Like, I need an answer. <laughs> what do you mean nothing? And he's like, no. He's like, I earned my medals in practice. I just pick them up on race day. 
So there are things that I learned in the, right? Isn't that good? I earned my medals in practice. I picked them up on race day. So, you know, a lot of us think when I get to success, that's the finish line and I'm going to feel good. But the people who have found they've been comfortable in the discomfort of Wonder Hell, they don't think about the finish line because they know that on the other side of this Wonder Hell is just the next one and the next one and the next one. So they don't think I'm going to perfect the finish. They think I'm going to perfect the process. And if I perfect Mm. the process and I focus on the habits every single day, then the finish takes care of itself. Interestingly, I, uh, in the book, because I read it, of course, you also make that point in the Chicago Bulls and the Last Dance documentary and how yes. one of the paraphrase, uh, you know, uh, frames from Michael Jordan was, I believe in my skills because I put the work in at practice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people were people. I, I remember I was on I was on my rowing machine in my garage watching that documentary. And he said, people ask me if I'm nervous. You know, like you did it once, you did it twice. Can you three-peat like the pressure that's on? He goes, mm. did I feel any pressure? He's like, nah, man, I didn't feel any pressure at all. I was like, how could you not feel any pressure? Right? You're about like you're standing on the edge of history making. Like, how could you not feel any pressure? And he's like, I didn't feel any pressure because I knew, knew that I'd done the work. Like I believed in myself. Yeah. I believed in my skills. And I literally like put the, the handle down my rowing machine and I was just like, damn. Just like note to self, like it was just like okay, and then I of course picked the rowing machine handle back up because I needed to perfect my skills. Oh, of course, you I did. Got it coming up, and I was like, I got to channel MJ, got to channel MJ. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that actually segues a really interesting question for you, and you use the the title or acronym MJ. Yes. And so you make the point in the book as well that sometimes to um, wade through your uncertainty. And to be on a stage, you enter into an alter ego, an LGO, yes. <laughs> and not Laura Gasner Auding. So yes. could you tell me a bit about how you discovered LGO and why or perhaps how others could use alter egos in certain situations to, to benefit from overcoming their uncertainty or their fear and uncertainty and doubt? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was in high school, I had a a friend, his name was Adam, uh, and he always called me LG because I was Laura Gassner, of course, where I was married and became Laura Gassner Odding. LG. And I was like, okay, whatever. That's cool. And then sometime uh, when I started speaking, uh, some others of our mutual speaker friends called me LGO just because Laura Gassner Odding is a really big name. (laughs) Uh, It's a lot of name. And uh, and, and I'm only 5'5". So, you know, LGO. And I never, like, it, it. people just started calling me that. So I was like, that's cool. That's cool. And I think a lot of our speaker friends think I was always LGO. But I'll tell you the truth, Dan. It, I actually didn't really fully embody who LGO was until last April when I got on stage in front of 5,000 people at this uh, network marketing conference. And this is a group of people who... um they sell caffeine patches that you wear on your arm, like slow drip caffeine. That there's comes such a, your there's such a thing. Wow. <laughs> there is such a thing. So I'm in front of, this is my first time back on stage after the pandemic. And I am on stage in front of 5,000 caffeinated people. <laughs> and it's like, welcome to the stage, LGO. And I'm wearing for the first time in my life, head to toe yellow because Aaron King, again, another one of our mutual speaker pals was like, Laura, you always post about these celebrities and their hashtag limitless yellow. You should do it. And I was like, I don't own any yellow. I don't even think I look good in yellow. Meanwhile, now I have a closet full of yellow. Right. But she's like, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to walk your walk. Got to walk your talk. So I stride out on stage. First of all, the announcer is like, badass, lightweight champion. Get the hell out of your way, you old world. You're welcome to the stage. Laura Gassner running. Like, let's get ready to rumble. And the music is pumping. And I stride out on stage wearing head to toe yellow. And the crowd roars. So I roar. And then they roar back. And I was like, oh, that's it. I got it. Like, the, I didn't have to be brave for 60 full minutes. I had to be brave for 60 full seconds. And uh. once I walked out on stage and they thought that I was confident, because by the way, you can't play small when you look like a giant highlighter pen. <laughs> you just got to like, you got to like own it. So I walk out on stage and I was LGO in that moment. And because I was LGO, they saw me as LGO. One of the things that I talk about in the beginning of the book is this, um, This looking glass principle where I'm not who I think I am and I'm not who you think I am. I'm who I think you think I am, right? I'm not who I think I am. I'm not who you think I am. I'm who I think you think 
I am. So when I walked out on stage and I was like, they're going to think I'm a crazy person. I'm a lunatic walking out here in yellow from head to toe. But they loved it because they loved it. And they saw me as like strong and fierce and badass. They were so into it. And I became that person. And so even though I, you know, even though you've always known me as LGO and I've been a little LGO, now I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Like I, like I, I get it. It's like, it's so fully in me as that's my alter ego, which is hilarious because as you know, I'm like kind of a raging introvert, like in private, like I'd rather just have a conversation one-on-one -on -one in the corner than ever work a room, but LGO man, she cannot be stopped. <laughs> okay. I love it. All right. Um, in the, in the back half of the book, there's a couple passages I wanted to call out and kind of concepts because they're really, really good. And uh, one of them was the scrambler <laughs> finding finding your own way. And in it, this following passage that I'll, I'll transcribe for you. Uh, to move forward on your own path through the doubt and the unknown, you must be forever willing to work hard at what you love over and over. So I was asking the question for you now, Laura, is that tell us a bit about this and, and how we scramble through to the other side in this Wonder Hell movement. Yeah. So the couple of stories that I tell in the Scrambler chapter are Brad Meltzer and Tiffany Bova. And yeah. Brad is a, uh, a, a very successful, multiple New York Times winning, best-selling thriller writer. He's written children's books. He's written uh, movies. He's written TV shows. I happen to have gone to high school with him. So I've known him for a very long time. Okay. Um, uh, and so I've watched his, I've watched his growth and I've watched his, his career. The other story is Tiffany Bova, who is the global evangelist, gro chief global evangelist for Salesforce. So um, she travels all the time and speaks like 150 times a year to huge stages. And each one of them have their own way of figuring out their, you know, how to get through the uncertainty and the doubt. Brad just sort of keeps going at the thing that he loves and reminding himself of when he was getting that early rejection. When he like thought after 23 rejections, the 24th was going to be the one that was finally going to get him out of debt. And he was going to be able to buy a, a ring and propose to his high school sweetheart, who, by the way, they're still married today. I've known her also for all this oh, time. Um, but the 24th call came and it was like, sorry, kiddo. And he was like, you know what? Fine. I'm going to write another novel. If they don't like that, I'm going to write another novel. And and in the story, he talks about sitting down with uh, David Baldacci, also, you know, huge, you know, successful, like what a what a what a pal to have for lunch, another successful Seriously. author. And he was like, man, he goes, I feel like such a jerk. Like, how can I complain about how hard this is? And he said what he said, David said something to him that profoundly changed him, which is if this was easy, everybody would do it. Like, yeah, we're not digging ditches, but if it was easy, everybody would do it. The reason that it means so much is because it's hard. And the fact that you get to find this thing that you want to keep coming back to and perfect because you care about the, like, you have the sorry kiddo chip on your shoulder, but you care about every single one of your readers. That's pretty amazing. So he said that he is able to get better and better at the thing that he loves because he figured out exactly what he loves and why he loves it and who he does it for and what he's trying to prove every single time. And I thought that was pretty cool. On Tiffany's side, Tiffany figures out who she takes criticism from, who she takes advice from, who she takes counsel from. And I talk a lot in Limitless about how we shouldn't take votes in our lives from people who shouldn't even get voices. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit on the other side of that. Tiffany actually invites feedback from every one of her, every one of her audience members. And now she doesn't take votes from people who shouldn't have voices. She seeds, you know, she throws up the ones that don't make any sense. But she says, if you want a copy of my slides, you need to write to me at this email address and tell me what I could do better. Tell me what you liked. Tell me what I could do better. And she she said, you know, she she said, you can't just tell me you liked my suit, right? Like, you got to give me some really good feedback. And she said that what she gets now is every single time she goes on stage in front of a thousand people, she gets like a hundred people, like an instant focus group. I loved the story. That one didn't resonate. I, you know, I heard you tell this story at that other event and I wish you would tell it again. And so she continues to get better and better and better because she's taking feedback from specifically the people who she wants to do better for. So in both of their cases, they sort of keep in mind the like, who are you doing it for? Why are you doing it? Why is it meaningful? And if we keep going back to that, rather than this sort of, you know, market whim of bigger, better, faster, more, or happiness, purpose, balance, you know, whatever the bullshit Instafluencer thing is 
happening at the time, it, it allows us to stay grounded about what matters to us. Because if what we're doing truly, you can't be insatiably hungry for someone else's goals, right? So like, if we're doing a thing that truly matters to us, that's when we're going to work through the hell to find that wonder. Oh, that's so good. I love that. And Tiffany is a friend of this show as well, has been on here before. I, just I saw, yes. Yeah. I love her. She's terrific. Okay. Uh, I love about Tiffany. Back to LGO. Laura, you have another section, which is profound, the Ferris wheel, gaining perspective mm. on other people, where you basically lay out these two really profound questions. One, which people lift you up and belong in your life? And two, which ones drag you down and need to, quote, get gone, which, by the way, I like. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my my infinitely better half Denise has a sort of a strategy long ago that she implemented called uh, I shelve people, <laughs> and I which is basically people. she shelves people because they're not reciprocating value in her life, which mm. led me to the which ones drag you down and need to get gone. So tell us a bit about the Ferris wheel, in particular this point about the perspective on other people and what we should be doing as we sail through Wonder Hell. Yeah, I mean, look, I think uh, <laughs> this is probably going to be my most uh, controversial chapter because I think I talk about burning bridges in this chapter. I'm uh, like, I'm yeah. all for burning the bridges. Yeah, I I do believe that burning bridges is something that we should do from time to time. So every time, like if you imagine a Ferris wheel, right? And every time you're successful, you get to the top of the Ferris wheel and the view changes, right? The view of the world changes, the view of yourself changes. And then you come back down again and you see the same people who were there before. And some of them you want to bring with you because they help you rise to an even higher place. And some of them are just pulling on that cart and they're pulling you down and they're slowing your drag. And I'm not saying like, you want to keep like up in your, your, your game. Like you want to like hang out with like the CEOs and like, no, like it could be anybody. Um, there are people in your life who will not like you when you get bigger because they enjoyed you when you were smaller than them. Mm. Right. So who are some of those people? Some of those people are jealous. They see your rise and all they can see is their own stagnation. Some of those people are scared. You run into them in the coffee shop and you tell them your big, hairy, scary dream. And they're like, you can't do that. That's too scary. And right. some of them really what they mean is I can't do that. I'm too scared. And for both of these people, when they're like, mm, are you sure you should be doing that? That's kind of a fancy car, right? Or like, are you sure you should do that? Is it... We hear those things and they kind of, we dismiss them in the moment, but they sort of seed themselves inside of our brain and then they start to grow. And then when things are hard and scary and dark, we're like, oh, maybe, maybe Madison at the coffee shop was right. Maybe it is too scary. And then we stop ourselves, right? We go back to that that voice in our head that's that that is saying, Oh my God, this is you haven't done this before. And we hear it as a limitation when really we should stick to it as an invitation. There's a third type of person though, and those are the ones who love us. And those I think these are the most challenging ones. And a lot of them are in our family. Some of them are our closest friends from long ago in life. The last time I lived in the same house as my parents, I was 17 years old. I didn't have a full frontal lobe. So I would bring the car back, of course, late for curfew. The gas tank would be on empty, but the, the radio volume would be on full, right? <laughs> and, 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 and so when I would tell my parents, I'm dropping out of law school to join this presidential campaign, or I'm leaving this marquee search firm to start my own, or I'm going to sell it, and I don't know what I'm going to do next. They were like, what are you doing? Because they don't want us to get hurt. And that's fair. They love us, but they also... They, they want what's best, like they have our interest, our best interests at heart, but they don't know our hearts. They don't know us anymore. And so some of these people, we need to burn the bridge and be like, you know what? Not interested. You know, there's that study that says that um, if you have obese friends, you're 57% more likely to be obese. Right. And what's interesting to me about that study is that it doesn't have to be like my friend that I hang out with and I have lunch with. It can be anybody. So if there is somebody who you are consuming their social media content, you're seeing their updates every single day and they're making bad decisions, you're likely to make bad decisions too because what they socialize, you socialize. What they read, you read. What they think, you think. What they normalize, you normalize. So we really have to be careful about all the inputs that are coming in. Some of them are actively toxic vampires in our lives, but some of them we don't even realize it's like tick, tick right they're just sort of like death by a thousand cuts and so what i try to say in that chapter is really to think about every time you come back down to earth and you're trying to figure out who to bring with you again 
we really need to make sure we're bringing with us people that are, are putting energy in our sails and momentum in our wings and are uplifting us along the way and who we also want to be uplifting as we go too. Brilliant. I couldn't agree more, particularly because my last name, Laura Pontifract, means broken bridge in Latin. So I'm burning bridges all the time. That's I'm You are a, you are a natural. Yeah, Somewhere I, a long time ago, one of your ancestors was like an arsonist. It was just like, yeah. It became innate. Let's go. Uh, okay, two two more <laughs> questions, and then we're gonna find out more where we can find out more about you. Uh I'm assuming you're a Springsteen fan because there's a whole package called Tunnel of Love. Yeah. So I'm just gonna leave it there. Tell us about Tunnel of Love and, and what it is and why. I am actually a Springsteen fan. I hadn't connected Tunnel of Love with that. Of course, that's one of his albums. Um, so the Tunnel of Love is really about like who do you take with you on this journey? And you know, I I interviewed our our mutual friend Alan Mulally, who of course, you know, saved Ford and you know, was was one of the people who really grew Boeing's commercial uh uh commercial aircraft uh, business. And, you know, the conversation I had with him was really about how do you how do you love on people to get the best out of them? Like, who are you bringing along with you on this ride? Because the person who you choose to put in that sidecar with you has a huge impact on where you're going, on your trajectory and whether or not you're actually going to enjoy yourself on the way. And when when um, I, and, and when, I, you know, when I was writing it, as I was as I was thinking about this chapter and then really funnily enough, I really didn't make that that connection. But um, uh, but I do want to tell a Bruce Springsteen story that 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 I love. Um, I, I really think that we can't get there alone. And so much of hustle culture today is about this individualistic thing. Right. Like I built it. I alone can solve it. I'm the miracle maker, like I'm going to crush it. And the truth is none of us get there alone, right? None of us get there alone. And so, you know, you and I had a conversation about your next book, thinking about the ideas. We're having this conversation now, helping promote my book. Like we all help and we all work together. And so the tunnel of love is really um, trying to help people be much more thoughtful about who should be in that world with them. And I think all of us at any given time should have an aspirational, right? Somebody we look up to who we want to be when we grow up. For me, that might be Tiffany Bova. <laughs> She's incredible. Um, we want to have a peer, somebody you can complain to, somebody who you can, you know, learn alongside, somebody who who um, is is sort of in the foxhole with you. And then I think we all have to have a mentee at any given time, because if you're feeling at all imposter syndrome, the best way to get through it is to teach somebody something you already know, because you're like, oh, I do know something cool, like go me, right? It makes us feel a little bit better. But I just have one very quick story about Bruce Springsteen that I love, um, which is that he did this great interview on the New Yorker radio hour where uh, he uh, he was asked about like how he found his signature sound. And he said that he, he got this invitation to go to his producer's office in New York City. And he got on the bus because he couldn't afford any other way to get there. And he had his guitar strapped to his back because he couldn't even afford a, 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 you know, a case for his guitar. And he like climbs up the 15 stairs and he's there and he's playing and playing and playing and playing. Um, because, and at the end of the meeting, the guy's like, we need to sign you. But the guy said, we need to sign you because he, when he got the invitation to have the meeting, he said, well, I don't play as well as Hendrix and I don't sing as well as Orbison. So I better figure out what I do do well enough. And so we figured he spent the entire weekend writing and writing and writing. And that music became um, uh, Asbury Park, right? That music became that wow. signature album. And when he went and he walked into this, this person's office, he's like, I just walked in and I put my foot up on the chair and I leaned down and I started playing and I didn't look up until I'd finished the whole thing. Like he gave this guy like his, it's incredible. It, right. But he like, but it just goes to show you that like, I can't be Dan Pontrefect. You can't be Laura Gastronomy. We can try, but we'll just be like a little less than. So we have to figure out who we are as ourselves, I think is really important. Oh, that's wonderful. That is incredibly that you've forgot the subliminal message of Tunnel of <laughs> totally Love and Springsteen, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> <laughs> what's happening here i know i know that's great i mean like the tunnel of love is like a ride so i just i like <laughs> listen there was a moment where i had like 50 different rides on post-it notes on my wall and i was trying to figure out like which one i should use and which one i shouldn't and which one is trademarked and i mean this is um actually the 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 idea about the amusement park comes from our friend rahaf harfush um, and as I was talking through the whole book and she's like, man, she's like, it's kind of like an amusement park. And it's like, <laughs> you are here. And I was like, oh my God, it is. And uh, she's like, every one of us feels lost in entrepreneurship. You are here. And then we just had the best time playing around with all the names of like Impostertown and Burnout City and Doubtsville. And there were like 
12 at one point. <laughs> okay, last question. Last before, question. Yep. Um, uh, I'm not going to ask you which moist song is your favorite between Push, Tangerine, or Silver. <laughs> but in, in two lines or less, what did you learn from David Usher, whom uh, is Canadian, I must say, and also lead singer of Moist. Yes. What I learned from David Usher is we all walk into the world with these big, huge, crazy dreams. And then people start to nitpick them. We don't have the technology. We don't have the staff. We don't have the budget. And he's like, by the time the dream is done, by the time it actually comes to fruition, it better be worth your while. So you better walk in with a dream that is as big as elephants. Right. Like if an elephant is going to have a baby, it takes two years of gestating. Right. A, a human takes nine months. An elephant takes two years. Puppies, it's like six weeks. So like you can have litter after litter after litter. The elephant still pregnant. So like if you want to do something big and it's going to take a long time, by the time it comes to fruition, it might be smaller than what you had hoped. So start way bigger and don't worry at all if people have no idea what you're talking about. You'll catch them up somewhere along the way. That's a BHAG, a big hairy elephant goal, Laura. That's yeah, BHAG, that yes, exactly. <laughs> a BHAG. <laughs> Listen, uh, as always, it's so good to chat with you. Tell us where we can find more out about Wonder Hell and you, of course. Yeah. So, LGO, right? Everyone calls me LGO. So, I am on all the socials at Hey LGO, H E Y L G O. Uh, you can go to HeyLGO.com. That'll take you to some lots of you know resources and stuff for my website. The book is available on April 4th, but it's available now for pre-orders at wonderhell.com. And so if you pre-order it now, you'll actually get all kinds of bonuses, like an early copy. You'll get an e-copy of Limitless uh, for multiple ver uh, multiple copies. You'll get the course. You'll get you know some drop-in virtuals. There's tons of good stuff there at wonderhell.com. It's an amazing book, I must say, and I thank you for allowing me that opportunity to read it well in advance. Uh, it's so changed, honored. <laughs> changed a few things in my own life, which uh, I'm always looking in the cracks or ways in which to improve myself. And Wonder Hell, Laura, is one hell of a wonderful book. So thank you for that. Thank you. Well, that's a good blurb. I want, I want to write that down and put your name on it and smack it on my website. <laughs> it's all yours, my friend. All right, thank Laura, you so thank much. you. LGO, both the double personality. I love both of them. Uh, and everyone that's watching or listening in, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Leadership Now. Take care, all.